Thanks so much. I have no relevant disclosures. A pretty smart guy told me that rectal cancer surgery is hard. These are words to remember and live by. In the last century, there were a few major technical advances in low rectal cancer management. The diagnosis and surgery was certain death until Ernest Miles developed what we now call the abdominal perineal resection in 1908. In the author's series of 100 papers, mortality and five-year survival was just over 40%, and that was a huge improvement. Technical refinements in learning about the anatomy continued over the next 50 and 60 years. And the development of adjuvant therapy helped improve recurrence and overall survival. In 1978, Professor Heal developed the total mesorectal excision with complete excision of the mesorectal envelope in the holy plane, which led to the best outcomes of recurrence, disease-free survival, and overall survival to date. Then using a multidisciplinary team with radiologists, pathologists, and oncologists, the results were found to be reproducible. But there was an ongoing need to reduce the morbidity and mortality of low rectal cancer, including managing functional and quality of life outcomes, which led to the transanal approaches. Over the last 40 years, we've had rapid innovation in these technical platforms, with expansion of minimally invasive surgery in endoluminal, transanal, laparoscopic, and also robotic platforms. And this is a circle, not a stepwise progression, because we continue to refine and develop each category with new solutions. The feasibility for transanal approaches was first seen in 1983, when Professor Buse developed the TEM platform. 30 years later, Mark Whiteford used the same platform for a note sigmoidectomy. And just a year after the TEM platform, Dr. Gerald Marks created the transanal, transabdominal procedure for ultra-low cancers. And these platforms and procedures were the entry into the rectum that helped advance the field. Now, there are limitations to transanal endoscopic microsurgery, which were addressed by Drs. Atala and Albert when they created the transanal minimally invasive surgery platform, or TAMIS. And both are valuable entries into the rectum for lesions um, up to the anorectal ring, or from the anorectal ring up to the sigmoid. But they both have limitations. They're really just for benign and early stage disease, but, and also used as a full thickness biopsy for operative planning. Laparoscopy also continues to be a valuable MIS tool, but there's technical difficulties of laparoscopy with instrumentation, visibility, and outcomes for rectal cancer. Trials to date have shown no superiority of laparoscopy for open or robotic surgery, and it's not non-inferior to open from the Alicart and Osicog randomized control trials. The best contribution to date from laparoscopy for low rectal cancer may be the TAMIS procedure. Now, robotics promises higher quality with improved visualization, access, accuracy, and precision. And there's been a battle between the robotics camps versus the transanal camps as far as doing a total mesorectal excision, saying that you don't need to do both, they're just tools. Um, both provide access, visibility, instrumentation, and acceptable outcomes to date. But that fight may be invalidated by the emerging transanal robotic platforms seen here from Dr. Marks. First trial is underway now, so we await the results. With both abdominal approaches, robotics and laparoscopy, there's major limitations. There's persistently high rates of conversion for low rectal cancers. Both of them haven't been able to go less than 10%. And there's a blind spot where we clearly can't see the distal margin or pass a stapler easily. And that has led to poor quality as far as positive CRMs within the TME plane. And that poor quality which we see in the results from the Color 2, ASCOG, and Alicart trials is because of the poor visualization and inability to see the distal extent of the tumor. And this is the need for transanal TME and transanal approaches. You can visualize and precisely define the distal tumor margin. From experience, we can now say that lesions within the low rectum, the last five centimeters from the anal verge, or the mid-rectum in patients that are either obese 
or have difficult anatomy from imaging are the ideal patients for this procedure. It's not a procedure for every patient. There's proven benefits with transanal TME. There's an extremely low conversion rate compared to the laparoscopic and robotic TME approaches, which again, have both been above 10%. There's also a very high quality specimen that's produced from the LORAC International Transanal TME database, which is probably the most robust and honest outcome source. We can see that there's a conversion rate that was less than 3% um, at the first 720 case audit. When we doubled that and looked again at almost 1,600 cases, it was less than halved. And ureteral injuries are also low. In doing over 6,000 cases now, we can determine the preoperative cases where we're at risk for a positive circumferential resection margin. And we also know the procedure-specific complications with transanal TME and the ways to mitigate them looking out for the urethra around the apex of the prostate, um, using ICG and stents to help, can help avoid membranous ureteral injury. CO2 emboli can occur when there is bleeding from the periprostatic veins, pressures that go above 15, and drop in end tidal CO2. And insufflation and smoke issues can be abated using a pressure-sensitive insufflator to stop that bellowing and to help with smoke evacuation. And for the join, which is unique to this procedure, there's been multiple papers written on recommendations by level and the factors associated with failure. Despite this evolution, there's controversy over transanal TME. Looking at outcomes in 110 cases between 2015 and 2017 in Norway, there were 10 local recurrences, or 9.5%, and a short time to recur with a unique pattern of rapid multifocal growth. Based on that, there was a national moratorium put on the procedure last year. The Association of Coloproctology of Great Britain and Ireland, which had previously published the training guidelines for the procedure, then followed suit, recommending a pause in stopping the national training programs for transanal TME. Is there a pendulum swinging away from transanal TME? So what should we do? Do we stop? Do we heed the cautionary trails of these early adopters? I'd say that we move forward, but not without hearing both sides. Because over the same time since the national moratoriums put in place the last year, these are the positive outcomes that have been published on transanal TME from experts, from high volume surgeons, high volume centers, including a Danish national study that rebutted the Norwegian outcomes. Transanal TME offers advantages related to sphincter preservation um, and blocking conversion rates down and the studies have all demonstrated good local regional control. To move forward safely, perhaps we have to use the lessons learned to date and elevate the education of the technology, not just throw it away. From the errors in the groups abandoning transanal TME, we have learned a lot. We know the importance of that secure, airtight purse string to stop leakage of tumor content from above and air into the colon from below. We know how important the tumorcidal lavage is after placing the purse string, the benefits of using monopolar cautery, especially around the nerves rather than energy sources, and then going to high volume surgeons. This again is not a procedure for every surgeon or every patient. High volume surgeons, high volume centers, where they do at least 25 of these a year. Marking the rectum circumferentially before tying your purse string is also important to make sure you have the right distance and performing the rectal incision perpendicularly because you'll otherwise be towed in and confined by the, the rectum if you try to go straight. The ideal location for transanal TME is probably uh, two centimeters above the anorectal ring. So if you have lesions below that level, it's more helpful to do an intersphincteric resection first to help seat your platform. And then laterally when you're doing your dissection, Divide the rectal urethral muscle close to the rectal wall. And posteriorly, when you're by the dentate line, go just off of that midline and divide the rectal coccygeal ligament to help facilitate your dissection. And anteriorly, when you enter the plane, make sure that you are um, above the level of the apex of the prostate, looking very closely for that membranous urethra. And most importantly of all of this is probably a standardized education program. And this was something that when the procedure was first introduced, was proposed by Dr. Silla and Whiteford. But the importance of this and breaking it into pre-training, interoperative training, and performance review are critical. So what do I mean by pre-training? Pre-training is literally practicing for a case. 
It's the technical and cognitive skills you need to have in your brain so that you can pull them out quickly and perform the case at a good cadence, strength, endurance, concentration, mindfulness, performance under pressure, the situational awareness of what's happening in the room around you, and also the psychological conditioning to control your room and control your case. You have to always watch others operate, learn the basics in wet labs, learn the basics in dry labs. But when we're advancing minimally invasive surgery, I wanna really um, push you to embrace the technology and use that to move beyond normal training. Take advantage of these new learning tools. With transanal TME, there are probably more tools available to learn than any other technique. You can watch case videos online and from journal websites, for the cadence, instruments, segmentation of steps. There's great ones even just on the Sages site. There's pre-recorded courses available online for free, dedicated teaching and training apps, and even VR modules for the procedure. For advanced cases, you can use software to model the patient's specific anatomy and help create your operative plan. And you can even use case data to learn the ideal technical points and where exactly you should resect before walking into the operating room. That gets you walking into the room ready to perform your procedure and pre-train. Interoperatively, there's also tools you can use to help with performance. I know we've talked a lot about fluorescence angiography already today for different uses. Here again, it can help define the ideal resection margins for your case, help with perfusion for the right point of resection, um, and also help identify anatomic landmarks like the urethra. Artificial intelligence can also be used and is really valuable even in the operating room now. With machine learning algorithms, you can use the preoperative imaging to help predict your outcomes from the planned resection and also what type of anastomosis to create. You can create a virtual reality environment from an MRI field to an anatomic model of the rectal cancer at the same model. And you can even use augmented reality live in the operating room and overlay it on your field to help identify critical landmarks. There's also the ability for live proctoring. Using some of these teleproctoring and telefenestration tools, we can communicate, interact, and augment live surgery across time and space. Now, this is a procedure where you're supposed to do a wet lab, go back to your institution, and do cases. At my institution, there was no one else doing these cases. For my first 20 cases, I was fortunate enough to have video and help so that I wasn't performing them alone. I actually had people in both London and Amsterdam that were in real time able to help me and guide me through a case safely. This is a valuable tool. There's also um, the need for performance review after you operate. And this is something we don't do enough of, and it's critical. After you finish your cases, you should grade your performance yourself and also have your mentor grade them. For transanal TME, there is a global assessment score that was created specifically for the procedure. And video review is also critical for improvement so that you can see the technical, cognitive, and interpersonal aspects that were in play during the case and develop an action plan to help advance. Multiple societies and groups are setting up formal coaching programs uh, and there's software that's already available for personal surgical coaching. With something like this, your videos can be uploaded and segmented automatically for the key steps of the procedure, then anonymously graded by experts on these key steps you can get your scores converted to a validated goals score, and you can see your progress over time. And this is important for continual growth. And don't forget to log your outcomes. Again, the International Transanal TME Database is probably the most robust and honest database anywhere in the world. It's important to look at how you do, and for us as a group to keep looking at what the outcomes are, what the obstacles are, and develop plans to keep moving the procedure forward safely. For people that need more evidence, there are three trials that are clinically underway. We anxiously await their results. But in the meantime, I would say, should we abandon transanal TME or transanal procedures? No. There's unique benefits of them for low rectal cancer. There's multiple tools and ways to approach these low rectal cancer, and you have to really rely on your own experience and comfort as well as for the patient and tumor specific factors. Transanal TME in particular has value and continues to evolve, 
and we should use the experience of others to improve the education and implementation and not abandon the procedure. Thank you.